radio show that officially does not exist. This is Planet Earth. Planet. This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and three criminal power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X. Well, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, wherever you are listening to Planet X today. I'm Neil Atkinson, and welcome to another show. Uh, we've got, as always, our Planet Experts in the studio, and it's a warm welcome back for Darren Perks is back. Yay, good evening. For Darren. Yay. He's good been be a back. very busy boy, but you're back with us. Yeah, it's great. It's good to be back in the studio and uh, cracking on with Planet X. It, it, when I'm not here, I'm in the background stalking. <laughs> Love it. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Anthony Beckett, Mr. Exopolitics himself, is uh, with us. Uh, welcome, Anthony. Well, thanks for having me, Neil, yes. And uh, we're going to be talking briefly about uh, the next Exopolitics, which I think is the fifth. It is the fifth year. Yeah, it's, we've been going for five years. I can't really believe it, really. I, c I can't believe it, A, that you've been going for five years and you haven't got any grey hairs. I'm getting there. For, for, <laughs> from doing exopolitics, because I know how stressful these things are. Uh, we'll talk more in just a little while, but we've got to mention our special guest tonight, uh, we, who uh, is going to be uh, joining us live on uh, the phone from the States. It's the one and only John Lear. Now, John, um, I could go on and on and on about him. He is a retired airline captain, uh, a former CIA pilot. Uh, he's also the son of the famous inventor of the Lear jet. Uh, he was best friends with the infamous Bob Lazar. And he's got some pretty, let's say, out there theories on all kinds of things to do with the moon, uh, to do with our solar system, uh, to do with ETs. Uh, tell us a bit more about uh, John himself, because uh, you've spent time with him out at uh, his ranch in America. Yeah, I did. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet John in May last year. Um, and the, the guy has a wealth of knowledge about UFOs that is it not only intriguing to listen to, but it, it's just so in depth. I mean, I, he first uh, pretty much got into UFOs back in the in the early eighties, uh, and he developed this special relationship with Bob Lazar, obviously connected to Area Fifty One. And um, John has over the years gathered so much information that he wants to share. Now he does have some pretty extreme views on the moon and jupiter and other things in space and that's what we're going to hear tonight from him but um i think what what i want people to do is um try and relate to what john tells you tonight because there is going to be some absolutely amazing facts that come out from him so okay stay right there for john lear on the show very soon let's go back to anthony now we've mentioned there at the start of the show it's uh, the fifth year of exopolitics um, we're going to be doing an ExoPolitics special next week. And uh, tell us who we've got lined up for next week's show. Uh, we've got Andrew Johnson, who's like a regular speaker at the conference. And yeah, he's, and he's a regular known, guest on, yeah, on Planet X. We've times. had him on a few times. And he's, he's well known for his work in, uh, well, he's a 9-11 truth activist and uh, do, looking at the uh, evidence for directed, use of directed energy weapons in 9-11. But for us, he's also been researching uh, basically anomalies in space and the solar system. And he's going to be t giving a talk about the secrets of the solar system. Okay. And uh, we've also got a, a former professor of, uh, of astronomy from Cardiff University. Now, I'm glad you're going to say his name because uh, <laughs> I've got it written phonetically in front of me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, Professor Chandra, Chandra Wick, Wick, well, um, Professor Chandra Wick Ramsingh, a bit of a uh, difficult one to say. He was basically currently the director of uh, the Centre for Astrobiology in Cardiff. And uh, one of the things he's been he was been doing from his, in his uh, since well, since about the nineteen sixties, he was working with uh, the late Sir Fred Hoyle, All right. who was actually a guy from my hometown in Bingley, in uh, near Keithley. And uh, they're basically in over I guess it's now 40, 50 years. They've been, they put together evidence from astro from basic cosmology, showing that there is evidence for bacterial life in space, and that might be uh, what caught basically seeds life on planets and other solar systems so they are going to be joining us on next week's show tell us uh, who else you've got lined up for uh, the the fifth year of exopolitics yes yeah, so we've got two what well, uh, three other people actually i'm speaking myself with andrew johnson i'm going to be discussing life on mars and the, the scientific evidence for that and uh, we've also got um, a regular um 
Well, I think a regular guest of yourself, haven't we? Well, yeah, apparently I'm going to be coming down and, and trying to host it. <laughs> yeah, Neil will, be host, Neil will be hosting the event. We've also got Mark Solon going to be talking about the moon landings and the um, lunar anom anomalies. And uh, Dolan. Ah, yeah, we've got Richard Dolan coming over from the Dolan. States. I knew there was somebody else. Yeah. And he's been, he did come over last year, but he's been a regular for the previous events. And he's uh, one of the basically leading his, the UFO historians. And uh, he was recently at the, um, well, the, the, Congrats the hearings in DC, and he was one of the kind of oh, the panels of experts. Citizens, uh, the citizens yeah, 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 hearing, yeah, which we, we uh, touched on a few weeks ago on, on so, a former Planet X show. Yeah, so he'll be coming over to discuss his more his more uh, recent research into the um, his latest, well, the third the pending third third volume of UFOs and the National Security State. Uh, now you mentioned Mars there and uh, some of the anomalies on Mars. I know that uh, John Lee, and you're going to stick around, aren't you, aren't you, Anthony, for for our interview with John Lee? I know uh, John's got some fairly out there thoughts about mars and uh, the fact that it's uh, it's got a population already living there there are uh, ets living there yeah and, and we'll, we'll um, get into that with him a little we're later we're going to go into that with him because he'll tell you about all the structures yeah. on mars and the moon yeah they're, they're connected okay i won't say anymore okay uh, that's all with john lear a little later on but uh, as i say an exopolitics special uh, next week but we'll get into uh, more about that on the show a little later on from extraterrestrials to exposing the truth this is planet x okay uh because darren is back uh, darren is always uh, posting stuff on the forums and i want to cover some of the uh, topics that you've looked at this week where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the, the WikiLeaks stuff on, on ETs? Oh, go on then. Uh, WikiLeaks. We all know what WikiLeaks are, where uh, you either hate it or you love it. WikiLeaks. Um, some of the uh, documents that have come out over the last few years have been mainly about the Iraq war and Afghanistan war and cables between the UN and the US government, the UK governments. But this week, for the first time, and this is quite significant, However, which way you want to look at it, there has been a new WikiLeaks cable document that acknowledges extraterrestrial life. Now, cast your minds back to about two or three years ago, there was all the talk of WikiLeaks. Would they speak about UFOs? Are they going to leak anything out? But what's come out is that a leaked cable from January 2010 was sent from the Afghanistan embassy to Washington, D.C., um, what you have here is an ambassador in Afghanistan who had a meeting with one of the local town mayors. And his basic quote in the cable was along the lines of, thank you to the USA for the continued help. We know that there is life on other planets, but we must have peace here first. Great statement to make because, well, Personally, I agree with that, but you know, there's got to be peace here before we go and uh, interact with extraterrestrial races. But this is the first time that this has popped up in WikiLeaks. It's the first time that it's been spoken in, in, in any way. The mainstream media haven't picked up on this. There's only a few people that I know of that have come across it. But go and have a look at it, folks. I've put it on the in the news section on the forum. People can go and read it. And there's a link there to the actual WikiLeaks uh, website. Uh, release if you like the page on that um, so yeah that, that's quite a good one because it's the first time that it's been acknowledged okay uh, another story that uh, you've posted on the forum and and this this has kind of been around for, for quite a few years is uh, the Japanese well uh, not so much the Japanese scientists uh, but the the um, using animals to uh, harvest human organs but uh, they're doing it in Japan apparently yeah Japan Japan seemed to be leading science at the moment i think um i i just i get the feeling that, that there's a lot more to come from japan yet as a country look in regards to things uh, like biological experiments if you like but their scientists are saying that they're expecting to be granted approval to grow human organs in animals like pigs uh, and then harvest them for transplant within the next 12 months uh again we know, and there's there's proof in the UK, the USA, and other countries that that we've been doing a lot of testing with animals, and we've been growing ears from rats and things. There's also a lot of problems associated with that, but Japan seem to be pretty pretty adamant with this. Um, th there are lots of theories that will go with this, but um, one of the sort of sinister side of it is the whole idea of harvesting these animals that have grown a couple of ears 
you know, on their on their limbs and things. So there is a sinister side to it. There's more to come out with this one. So again, uh, there's more on that on our forum at planetxlive.co.uk. Uh, quickly, some fracking news. Oh yeah, this is great. Obviously, uh, in the news, uh, the BBC News, Sky News, all the major uh, news channels this week have been talking about fracking. It's cropped up again. Um, and uh, the Liberal Democrat minister, I forget what his name is. He's got ginger here. Um, but basically, he's responsible for uh, environment or di different things. I'm not too sure. But what they've said is that fracking in the uk is a multi-billion dollar industry that they the government wish to exploit and they wish to start using for a, a new energy resource now we know we've seen both sides of the argument that fracking is not necessarily a good idea and um, there's also been talk that if fracking was to go ahead in england wales and scotland then uh, a lot of people's water within within the the uh the fracking locations would, would possibly get contaminated by the gas uh with the shale grass reserves which is not a good thing on another connected note uh president obama is in south africa this week um visiting the country on the 28th of june he said on twitter and i quote we can't just drill our way out of the energy and climate challenge that we face today that's not possible in which I replied to him, yeah, say no to fracking. So we're not too sure what Obama is referring to. I suspect it's probably oil. But then on the other side of the coin, fracking comes into it as well. So nice of Mr. Obama to acknowledge the fact that we can't go drilling. Unfortunately for him, drilling for oil also means drilling for gas, which we don't want in this country. So. And of course, if, uh, if they brought in the free energy, it'd all be fine. We wouldn't need it. So Anti-gravity. Yeah. Free energy. It's the future. Um, <laughs> let's quickly talk about the NASA documents as well. There's uh, been a lot of stuff on this uh, all over the, the internet of various Facebook uh, pages. And, yeah. Uh, it's kind of gone viral over the last few weeks. Yeah. We're basically, uh, Mr. Bushnell, who's a NASA scientist at the NASA Johnson Space Lab in um, in, in the US. And I'm going to bring Ants on, in on this and see yeah, what your yeah, thoughts are to, as well. To hear, to hear your view on it. But with, with what, what you've got is a 114-slide PowerPoint presentation that this guy wrote for NASA. And he talks about future war concepts in, in the year 2025. And, and one of the slides that I picked up on was... Uh, bots borgs drones and humans and he talks about the possibilities that the enemy may have now this is something that's been given quite a bit of attention in the last few days um so i decided to do a little bit more digging into the nasa science department and their older news releases and what's coming out is that nasa it looks like that they've been trying to develop a new propulsion system using microwave and laser beam technology. A Japanese scientist, again, uh, a professor, Leek Moirabo, back in 1987, started testing with a five meter diameter flying saucer craft, and he was successful and managed to get it to fly. But the whole thing was then put under wraps. We haven't heard anything else about it, which begs the question, did NASA utilize that technology? Did the military utilize that technology? Uh, I've put it on the forum and there's a link to another website that I've put with as a YouTube video and people can see footage of this craft being tested. It's absolutely phenomenal, but what it means is that there is a whole new propulsion and energy source, but they've not bothered to uh, make it public. It's there to read if you look for it. Yep. Let's uh, get answers, uh, views on that. What do you think? That's well, kind of fascinating. I, one of the things that struck me initially about that article, actually, I didn't read the entire thing. I just got uh, scanned over it. But uh, it was it was it was read a bit like quite like the Project for New American Century kind of document in its way. And I'm thinking, why is NASA doing? Why would yeah. NASA be involved in that? But anyway, regarding like the actual development of uh, what we consider to be, you know, what we'd call the UFO technology. Um, back in 1956, it's kind of well widely reported that uh, it was actually in uh, Nick Cook's book, Hunt for Zero Point. That uh, some of the mainstream, really, the kind of really big uh, aviation companies were, were developing anti-gravity platforms. Well, but I think we'll we'll actually is, you'll hear this from John Lee. I think his dad actually cracked uh, anti-gravity, as you say, yeah. uh, in the late uh, sort of fifties or the mid fifties. Well, that's it. In that, so, like nineteen fifty-six, it kind of all stopped. And the question you have to ask, outside of <laughs> listening to John Lee, would be: Well, did it? Did, 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 the, did the platform simply not work, or did it go black? Mm. 
And so the one, I, I, I met a physicist actually in, in a few years ago in the States at the X conference, a guy called um, Tom, Tom Vallone. Dr. Tom Vallone, and he basically is a he's a physicist, and he's, he, proponed, he was a proponent of the idea that the B two bomber, for example, utilizes electrogravitic propulsion, so it has an electric mode rather than just a kind of a it's kind of normal propulsion mode. But any one of the things he does, he he's actually does, does lectures on gives lectures at the State Department in the U S on UFOs to people at the State Department, and one of the things is he argues is that what you've actually got in the black world technologies is something you, 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 you know you never get it out so what you need to do is develop it in the white world and this is kind of an example of that maybe happening you know by accident maybe in yeah. modern design but, that, but once it does happen uh yeah it gets hushed up again maybe it's it's it, it's it, it's it's thoroughly it, i mean this 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 article that i've come across was april 1999 and he, this professor was developing it with students then of course since then after the b2 bomber we've got the tr6 telos which we've covered on the show before mm -hmm. which is again it's the new propulsion using anti-gravity so this isn't going to go away for the authorities uh the public are aware that they're testing this type of uh, tech and if this guy can use laser beams and microwaves to, to propel a craft five meters diameter through the air back in 1999 what are they doing now today absolutely um all that stuff uh, that we've just covered is on the forums uh, check it out on planetxlive.co.uk the radio show that officially does not exist this is planet x planet x Okay, uh, just before we get to John Lear, who's uh, going to be joining us from the States, I, I want to touch on something that's uh, been in the news for, I think, just over a week or so. I think it was the, the Daily Mail that picked up on it first. It's the Curse of Tutankhamun at uh, the Manchester Museum. Have we all seen that? Yes, yeah, it was... Um it, obviously this was across the press and uh, it was on the TV and it's obviously gained uh, worldwide attention. Um, I'll some... just, shall I read the quote from the Daily Mail just in, in case uh, maybe some of our listeners, yeah. maybe some of the uh, the overseas listeners because it's certainly taken uh, the UK by storm. But uh, just in case some of you haven't heard about it and I'll read this from the Daily Mail. It says the curse of Tutankhamun is said to have claimed more than 20 lives. By contrast, the curse of... now. I, the, the professor, the doctor is uh, is on the line, so I, I hope I say this right. Is this right, uh, A.M. Ne Neb? Neb Senu. Senu. <laughs> Amounts to little more than an occasional uh, inconvenience for museum curators. Uh, over several days, the 10-inch Egyptian statuette gradually rotates uh, to face the rear of the locked glass cabinet in which it's displayed and has to be turned around again by hand. Those uh, who like tales of haunted pyramids and walking mummies May we got the mystery of the 4,000 year old relic and offering to Osiris, God of the Dead, as the strangest thing to have hit Egyptology in decades. So that kind of sets it up a little bit. And uh, I'm very pleased to say that we've got uh, the uh, curator of Egyptology and the Sudan on the line uh, from Manchester Museum. Uh, very warm welcome to Dr. Campbell Price. Welcome to Planet Hello. X. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> now, I just quoted there from, from the Daily Mail. Did I get most of that right? Yes, just about as, as, as right as the Daily Mail can be, <laughs> I suppose. Um, I, we're, we're really uh, overwhelmed with the... the attention this this story has got um something we noticed in the gallery uh, and and filmed over the the course of a week um and yes it's 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 proved very popular um now how long has this been going on for and and, and when did it all sort of go public who, who was the first to pick up on it so um we reopened our, our ancient worlds galleries um at the end of last year um, to celebrate the centenary of the first egypt gallery at manchester and so we have very nice new uh, brand new display cases and um as soon as we we opened one particular um object this statuette of neb senu um i went into the gallery the day after we opened i think um and he was facing the back of the case, and I thought this is very strange. Um, the case is locked, it's alarmed, um, and I'm one of only a very small number of people with a key. I don't think the other people were playing a joke on me. Um, and so it seemed very mysterious, so we thought we would share it uh, with, uh, with the public, and the public have taken to it. Absolutely. Now, we've had lots of people coming out and saying, uh, or giving their thoughts and views sure. on what it could be. Um, a certain Mr. Professor Brian Cox has uh, had his two pennyworth worth 
a lot of people saying it's it's a vibrational thing, maybe caused by the amount of traffic going past. Yes, I mean, honestly, I mean, I, th I think if I could could cut to the, the the chase, given all the opinions we've we've had a chance to collect, um, it seems to be a combination of footfall in the gallery um, of visitors and traffic outside on Oxford Road, the main uh, road that runs past the museum, um, and it's just really a one in a million chance that the statuette whose base is a bit uh, convex, um, made of stone on a glass shelf, um, moves. It moves very slightly, imperceptibly, um, and we were able to, to, to track that with time-lapse um, photography. But the mystery is, of course, it, it spins in an exact circle. It doesn't wobble to um, any one particular side. So... It, it makes a great story, and I think it says more about uh, popular interest in, in Egyptology and the supernatural than it does about uh, Neb Senu, the owner of the statue himself. And I think, uh, Campbell, it's Darren speaking. I think, Hi, uh, Darren. Yeah, I, I've looked at the Coriolis effect. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, I've looked at of all different angles, from mm -hmm. vibrations to traffic to people walking past, even to the notion that behind the wall where the case is, is there a lift or a, mm -hmm. an escalator? But the Coriolis effect is quite interesting because one of the theories we, we, we looked at was it's got a slight convex base mm -hmm. to it. Now, with, with the Coriolis effect, for those that don't know, in the northern hemisphere it would turn clockwise, in the southern hemisphere it would uh. turn anti-clockwise. Now, this statue could be asymmetrically weighted and balanced, mm -hmm. if you like. I mean, I don't know. I'm not. I haven't uh, tested it like you guys have. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I thought about was, if it was relating to the Coriolis effect, mm -hmm. was there inside the statue maybe some sort of um, uh, hollow area, if you like, that you hadn't detected that may contain a substance like water that may be adding to the Coriolis effect when it turns. Um, have you guys x-rayed that? Or? We've not. We've not x-rayed mm. it um, or CT scanned it. Though we've been CT scanning our mummies. Little did we know we should probably be CT scanning this, um, this statuette. It's interesting mm. you, you, you mentioned the, the asymmetrically balanced um, aspect of, 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 of waiting so that's something Brian Cox picked up on yeah. he said you know it's, it's he called it differential friction but you, if you look at a photo of the statue you see there's the part where the man is standing and then there's this projecting base yeah. so I could I could be convinced that yeah that's 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 a cause I though think, we haven't yeah. x-rayed it yet I think I think I mean I don't you don't have to take my word but yeah it'd yeah be great if you guys could go and x-ray it and then maybe maybe we could come yeah, back and let us know the results two. because yeah. I, I, you may I mean it's just my theory but if there is a hollow chamber inside that statue that maybe adds to the Coriolis effect there might be liquid inside that you're not aware of then mm -hmm. that that is then the, the definitive cause yeah that, that's that's very interesting thanks but yeah no uh, let us know and uh, it would be uh, fascinating to find out uh, uh, is there anything any sort of evidence pointing one way or the other or is the the jury's still out on everything. The jury's, the jury's still out. I mean, we've had some work done on um, another part of the gallery, um, and the statue has not moved in the last few days. Um, so maybe that has just been the, the slight change that has stopped the very fine um, balance of the, the vibration. I'm not, not, not absolutely sure. Um, but I'm certain that it's been a very popular... <laughs> that, that clip on YouTube has been uh, incredibly popular. It just... It, it plays to a popular interest um, in the unexplained which is, is no bad thing for our um, uh, footfall yeah i was going to say has uh has, has the interest in the manchester museum gone up over the last couple i would of weeks? say <laughs> anecdotally over the last week yes definitely really? the visitors have gone up and it's exciting for me as the um the egyptology curator to have people come in to look at one particular object because they have may have heard certain theories about it um, and for them to see our incredibly rich group of other objects that may not move but are um, equally if not more interesting uh, I've just got to mention as well um, that you actually qualified. We, we uh, the show comes from Liverpool. You actually qualified ah, yes, in yes. Liverpool, at Liverpool University. I did. I studied Egyptology at Liverpool University, which is the best place to study Egyptology in Western Europe. Wow! Really? Yes, biggest department in 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 in, uh, in Britain. Uh, I've just got to also mention that um, because of, of all the the sort of fame that you've you've gained over the last week. You, I don't you, know fame or infamy, uh, well, I don't know. Well, you, yeah, you actually uh, ended up in the Sun newspaper and apparently your mum and dad were horrified. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I phoned them up. I said, um, if you buy the Sun, 
I'm on page 23. <laughs> <laughs> and you know in Liverpool, that's, that's yeah. Well, yeah, it is. It's no, a bit of an it's, issue. It's the, the, yeah, the daily scum yeah. in Liverpool. So, <laughs> yeah. Just don't do anything again for them. No, no. exactly, exactly. I think I'm <laughs> on the straight and narrow now. All right, well, listen, uh, great talking to you. Pleasure. And uh, be great to get you back on again at uh, some point. In yeah, yeah. If, uh, if there's uh, any sort of answers to, to the mystery. Yeah, great. Uh, for now, though, Dr. Campbell uh, Price from the uh, Manchester Museum, thank you for joining us. Cheers, thank you very much. X marks the spot. This is Planet X. It is indeed Planet X. I'm Neil Atkinson, and tonight uh, we're joined in the studio with our Planet Experts, Darren Perks. Uh, Anthony Beckett is also here, the organiser of Exo Politics. Um, just off the, the back of that call, though, we were talking to Dr. Price, uh, Dr. Campbell Price uh, from the uh, Manchester Museum. You've got a few points that you wanted to add, Anthony. Yeah, the idea of this uh, statue that kind of revolves by itself, seemingly in this kind of cab closed cabinet. That's pe people have been uh, kind of uh, you know kind of trying to dis discover what's kind of causing it. One of the issues, it highlights an issue, uh, highlights an issue which kind of broadens into what we're going to talk about later with John Lear, I guess, in that uh, it's people assume it's just some supernatural phenomenon or possibly just a physical natural uh, phenomenon for something ultimately like Coriolis, the rotation of the Earth or whatever. However, it kind of it begs the question: Well, how, if it was, if something is intelligent cause, how would you know? And there's, the problem is, there's, there's something within the, within sci uh, science called the rule of the rule of methodological naturalism, and that states that the statements of science should infer only natural things and processes. So it's almost as if the scientific method, as it is, isn't really in a position to state to be able to measure to detect. Uh, or, dis or make statements really about uh, in intelligent to cause things. So much so that it's been argued that something is, is kind of obvious as Stonehenge. And science can, can all it can do is trying to look for natural processes and that caused Stonehenge to happen. You can't not, cannot make, can't make statements to say, look, some guy it was intelligently caused. Uh, interesting, and uh, we will put some of those points uh, to John. He is on the line right now from the States. Uh, really looking forward to this interview. Um, Darren, you've spent time with him as well. Just uh, tell us a bit more, or tell our listeners a bit more about uh, John Lear. Yeah, John Lear was a uh, ex-test pilot. He flew lots and lots of uh, different aircraft in the United States. He holds some uh, some airspeed records as well. I think it's about 18 in total. His father basically invented the Learjet. He's best friends with Bob Lazar, who is still alive and still kicking. And uh, he knows just about everything he needs to know on Area 51, UFOs, the moon, Mars, you name it. Yeah, he's got some pretty uh, out there thoughts and views. Uh, and he's on the line right now. Welcome to Planet X, the one and only John Lear. Hi, John. Hey, how are you doing? How are things over there? Pretty good. Um, it's uh, a lot later than it is over where you are. You're live in, in uh, Nevada, uh, so it's pretty early for you. Lots of things to talk to you about. Um, Let's start at the beginning because uh, we've got the, you know all kinds. We've got the Bob Lazar stuff. We've got your theories on the moon, uh, the solar system, ETs. But let's start with with your history, your background, and for any of our listeners who who don't know who John Lear is, uh, just tell us a bit about you and and and, uh, and your background. Well, I um, grew up uh, in Santa Monica, California, and um, and also went to school over in uh, Switzerland. I actually went to three boarding schools over there, and uh, I started to learn how to fly at uh, 14 uh, years old because uh, my dad had lots of airplanes around in Santa Monica, and they had a Tri-Pacer and a 172 and Lockheed Lodestar and stuff like that, and he didn't want me to be a pilot, but uh, I insisted, and uh, I got my commercial rating at 18 and started flight instructing and um, I got a job uh, you know little flight instructing jobs until I fell into this one that uh, was flying uh, Air Force FAC airplanes forward air control airplanes over to uh, Vietnam from Wichita Kansas and that was pretty nice it was a, a good time builder because it was actually about 66 hours over there <clears throat> and uh, from that, I went to, uh, uh, let's see, Chief Pilot of Lacey Aviation, flying Learjets. And from that, I went to uh, flying 707s uh, up in Seattle for uh, Aero America. That's not Air America, that's Aero America. <clears throat> and then I was uh, over in the Laos uh, for a year or so flying uh, the C-46. And uh, then I went to Egypt for a couple of years. 
And uh, let's see, that brings us up to uh, 1983 when I went to work for American Trans Air. And I worked for them for five years <clears throat> until a uh, newspaper um, reporter was doing a story on me in 1989. And uh, I said I would do the story as long as he didn't mention my name. And he says, oh, you have my words on her. And uh, when I picked up the paper the next day, the first words were, John Lear, captain with American Trans Air. So, needless to say, that was the end of that job. <laughs> I went to work. I went to work for uh, a bunch of um, cargo airlines, uh, Coletta and Connie Coletta, and uh, Air, and um, oh, what was the name of that thing? Uh, can't remember. Anyway, uh, finished my uh, career flying uh, out of uh, India. Uh, for uh, subcontracting for um, uh, India, uh, Air India, and since then, and that's nineteen uh, or that's uh, twenty oh one. I've been retired and uh, just sitting here enjoying myself, uh, picking on a lot of. Uh, now that I have time, picking on a lot of um, uh, conspiracies. Well, I love, I, I, John, I love your take on, on your theories um, because you say you got into this for you, for yourself. And if other people want to come along, you know, for the journey, for the ride, they're interested in, in what you, you've got to say, then that's great. But uh, primarily you started this whole journey, um, you know, and, and your thoughts and your theories just for you, for yourself. Yeah, I, if often I get uh, somebody will say, well, how do you expect us to believe this and that? I don't expect you to believe <laughs> this is for myself and I can't possibly bring everybody up to uh, what I believe because it just takes too long. Now, I, I admit that at one time there was a, uh, a time when I could bring people up to uh, speed, but uh, there's just too much out there to bring people up to speed. So, you know, if you want to hear what I believe in the short, I'm happy to tell you, but uh, there's no way I could convince you. Mm. Well, we're going to hear a lot of your thoughts uh, over the next hour or so. Um, let's go back to um, when you were flying. You, you did some flight for the CIA, didn't you? Yes, that was uh, two times, uh, well, three, four, several times. Uh, let's see, the first time was in 1967, flying uh, the O2, which was a Ford Air Control airplane from Cessna to uh, Nha Trang, South Vietnam. And that was a CIA contract. I did that for four years. And then in uh, 1972, uh, I went to work for them in Laos, flying um, C-46s and Twin Otters, and I did that for less than a year. And then in 1977, uh, I did a small contract, which was uh, to Mogadishu, um, flying uh, arms and ammunition when we decided to uh, uh, help the Somali uh, get on their feet. And this was way before all the stuff that's happening now, but uh, I was in on the very beginning of that. We've uh, had a, a former guest on who used to work for the, the drug baron, Pablo Escobar. And uh, he, uh, good evening, Frank, if you're listening. Um, but he, whilst he was working there for Pablo Escobar in Colombia, he said that uh, two of the biggest customers in the, the, the drugs game were the Vatican okay. and the CIA. Did you see hey, anything? You say that again? We had uh, a former guest on, and he worked for Pablo Escobar for, for a time in Colombia. And yeah, two, of the, yeah. two of the biggest customers were the CIA and the Vatican. Did you see anything in towards when you were working for them, any strange cargoes that you had to fly? No, because all my stuff was in country. Uh, by that, I mean... Um, uh, all my stuff was uh, from point A to point B, but nothing out of country. Um, we flew um, just arms and ammunition, uh, you know, it, it, within Laos. So that wouldn't give us any chance to uh, uh, to, to ferry any uh, drugs or stuff. But I did keep track of it. For, you know, one of the major, the best books on, uh, <clears throat> on uh, drug trafficking was uh, Drugs uh, and... Uh, Heroin CIA by um, uh, what was his name um, McElroy I forget 
drugs and heroin it, yeah, it in was, Southeast it, Asia. It was McAvoy, John. Yeah, that is that. That pretty much gives the whole low down on the uh, the inside stuff on that. Yeah, he had um, he had the maps and everything where we flew. I mean, they were really accurate. Uh, but there was nothing in my airplane. He had uh, stuff going out of country, but but none of the stuff in country. Let's uh, let's crack on and, and move it on to Area Fifty One. Uh, now, this is a, a part of the world that uh, you, you know quite well. What came first? I mean, did you did you discover, uh, you know, about Area Fifty One and Groom Lake before you started uh, a friendship with Bob Lazar? Oh yeah, way before. Uh, in 1977, I was um, uh, well. Actually, before that, we knew there was a secret strip up in that area, but we didn't know where. Thank you. Uh, so I thought it was up at the Tonopah test, test range, but as it turns out, it wasn't. Uh, and we kept looking for it, and then finally, um, uh, let's see what happened. Oh, a friend of mine. Uh, I was out soaring at uh, Pahrump, Nevada, and we were just talking about secret areas, and this guy said, oh, yeah, I used to work up at the test site, but no Area 51 stuff. And so then that clicked with me, no Area 51 stuff. <laughs> what, what could Area 51 be? So uh, then almost uh, coincidentally, uh, another friend of mine said that he had been working for a company named Carco, and they were the subcontractors uh, before um, uh, before uh, Nevada op- uh, the uh, Nevada operations for uh, EG and G uh, that used to take people up to Groom Lake, and he told me about a huge runway. And I said, did it have a name? He said, yeah, it was called Groom Lake. So I matched up Groom Lake with the old maps of, uh, surveying maps of uh, southern Nevada, and it matched with Area 51. And incidentally, there is no Area 52. That That's BS. Now, they may have named it since then Area 52, but there was no Area 52. Uh, the actual last uh, portion northbound uh, was Area 51. So that's how I put them together, and then uh, I had a lot of friends that uh, flew up there and got little hints here and there about uh, about what they flew, and, and that's how it all came together with Area 51. I mean, uh, with I, I know last year, John, when we when we came to visit you in in May, and before we went up to Area 51 and uh, subsequently got detained for trespass. The area, just to give people an idea, if if, you, if they've never been to sort of Nevada, the area is huge, isn't it? I mean, you've got Groom Lake, Papoose Lake, Dry Dog Bone Lake. It's all falls within the Nellis Test Range, and it's a restricted area, isn't it? Yeah, all of that is a restricted area. And if you ever had read that book by the guy that wrote three books, and he was the one that interacted with the um, uh, with the tall whites, and uh, they have their own. <laughs> We built their own hangar and uh, and um, living quarters to the northwest of um, Dry Bone, uh, uh, Dog Bone Lake. Was that uh, the Charles Hall, the Indian Springs Good yeah. Ranges? Yeah, Charles Hall. John, with with the, the the whole public notion and the whole public interest with Area Fifty One is 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 huge, and you know that. Um, has been partly to blame for the media and there's a lot of hype surrounding it um, and you can't get within 25 miles of the actual base because of the restricted boundaries and obviously the camo dudes uh, and the security is, is very very tight and you, you know you, you can get put in prison for six months if you go on to the restricted area uh, I'm a believer and I know many people listening to the show tonight believe that the U.S. military has some sort of may reverse engineered technology at that facility in the sub levels. Could you tell us what what you know or what information you gained over the years from the sub levels, and especially you know the, the underground railway that you spoke of? There was at least uh, five levels when they started, and those levels were built by uh, the uh, Navy Seabees. Uh, groom uh, or uh, the groom runway was actually built 
in 1942 for uh, testing aircraft and uh, pilot training. And uh, at the end of uh, World War II in 1945, um, they de deactivated the uh, the uh, airport there. The airport was not the one that we see today. It was the one on the far uh, east, northeast side of the uh, strip, and it's a T-shaped uh, runway, and you can still see it on uh, Google Earth and uh, several other strips there. Uh, they reactivated again in 1948. They sent the CPs in there to build the underground uh, portion of uh, Groom Lake over on the west side where everything is now, but at that time there was nothing there. And so they built those five underground strips and it was extremely secret. I mean, not even the CIA knew about that. And uh, so they uh, had an operation there with f three levels where they had the saucers. And uh, then in 19, uh, that w ended in, or, you know, that started in 1949. And uh, and then in 1954, 55 is when Kelly Johnson sent uh, Tony LaVere and Fish Salmon up there to uh, uh, find a, a strip uh, for the uh, U-2. And that's when coincidentally and completely accidentally, they found the strip that was directly over uh, where, the, um, where they had the five stories, uh, five levels of uh, underground uh, uh, underground areas for the saucers and other stuff they had to hide. That, that, yeah, that, that's interesting. You mentioned the sources there because the, 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 the it said, I mean, I've not been there myself and uh, I don't know anyone that has, but it said that the underground levels housed a, a, a number of different areas for research and technology. And one of the said areas was obviously to house the flying saucer technology so that you know, people could work on it. And the other one was uh, said to sort of look after the the beings that were supposedly recovered from the from the Roswell crash that were eventually taken up there. Uh, what I'm referring to there is obviously J-Rod. Now, tell us a little bit about Bob Lazar and, and your connection with him. Okay, first of all, you mentioned J-Rod. J-Rod is a complete fake. Uh, it's uh, w They were made by... Um, the uh, the uh, black intelligence people, or the uh, uh, the uh, what do you call them, the uh, underground <clears throat> people, uh, it's a fake. They're trying to make him as if he was a gray, but he's not. He's taller. And uh, but anyway, going on to Bob Lazar. In 1988, I gave a um, <clears throat> a lecture here in uh, uh, Vegas. And uh, on UFOs, and a guy called me and asked uh, if I could give him my tapes and stuff. And uh, I said, well, I've gotten out of it, but uh, if I ever get back into it, I'll let you know. And he said, okay, well, look, I'm an appraiser, and I'll trade you an appraisal for your house uh, if you uh, will give me all your tapes and papers. I said, well, look, I need an appraisal right now. So uh, let's do it. So he came over the next day, and he brought a guy to hold the measuring tape, uh, other end of the measuring tape, and that guy was Bob Lazar. And he brought me his, he brought me his um, um, resume, which included um, a, uh, uh, which included graduation papers from MIT and Caltech, Cal uh, California Institute of Technology. <clears throat> And uh, we started talking about uh, saucers, and uh, this guy, Bob Lazar, kept <clears throat> looking up at the sky and rolling his eyes and everything. And, and we finally said, what's the matter, Bob? Don't you believe? He said, no, it's not possible. He said, I worked at Los Alamos National Labs, <clears throat> and uh, uh, if there was such a thing as that, I would have known. He said, I had the highest clearance, which is Q clearance, and uh, it, it just could not be. So anyway, it took... Uh, four months for me and uh, Gene Huff, who we nicknamed Goofon, uh, to convince Bob that there might be something there. And the things that were convincing, convincing him is we knew about the um, uh, double X, let's see, what was the name of that thing? Double X, double Q, something, a name of a post office box. And uh, also about Project Grudge and um, something else we knew about. Oh, Excalibur. 
<clears throat> and with those three things that uh, we couldn't have possibly known without some inside inside information, uh, Bob decided to get a job up at uh, Groom Lake. And the way he did it was he called uh, Doctor um, um, Doctor what, what's the guy's name who invented the H phone? Teller. I'm a little lazy. Do- called Doctor Teller, and uh, I was actually there when he called him and. Uh, he, Dr. Teller said, well, what can I do for you, Bob? He says, I'd like to reenter the scientific community. Uh, I'd like to come to uh, to work. And he said, great. Well, uh, Dr. Teller said, great. Would you like to work here in California uh, with me at uh, Livermore, or do you want to work uh, in Nevada? And Bob said, I want to work at Groom Lake. So Dr. Teller said, let me get back with you. I'll have somebody call you. So uh, a week or so later, uh, Bob was called and told to report at the EG&G uh, headquarters down at uh, McCarran, <clears throat> and he was given an interview. And uh, actually, the first uh, he was given three interviews. The second interview, the first question was, uh, "Do you know John Lear, and what is your relationship with him, and uh, or what do you think about him?" <clears throat> and so Bob said, "Yes, I know John Lear, and I think he sticks his nose in places where it doesn't belong." What Bob told me was that he also likes to stick his nose into places where it doesn't belong. But he didn't tell them that. So anyway, then now uh, we go up to December 6th, he, uh, he shows up at my house, which he always comes over in the evening and sits down and we talk about stuff. He said, I saw a disc today. And I said, what? He said, I saw a disc today. And I said, theirs or ours? He said, theirs. I said, well, what are you doing here? Did you go to Grim Lake? Obviously, they followed you. If they let you up there, they're going to let you talk with me. He said, uh, well, they may have, but you have taken so much baloney for the past six months that I've known you that I wanted to tell you it's true. I touched it. I saw it. It's real. It's uh, interstellar. I mean, it couldn't possibly be from Earth, and I wanted to tell you it's real. So that was the beginning with Bob Lazar. We, John, we were talking about this on the show uh, last week, uh, that there's a lot of whistleblowers coming out now. And Bob Lazar, if you like, was one of the, if not the original whistleblower, wasn't he? Yeah, I can't remember anybody else unless you call, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, what's his name over in Switzerland, uh, Eddie, uh, Billy Myers. And to this day, I will stick up for Billy. He was real. He did ride in the saucer. A lot of his writings are not correct or interpreted incorrectly, but the whole Billy Myers thing was true. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've actually done a show on, on Billy Myers. Uh, but yeah, no, Bob, uh, for me, was, was one of the first whistleblowers. Um, and when, when you come out with stuff like that, there's, there's, there's only a few ways that the, the government uh, can go. They can, you know, if they go after him, then they're kind of giving credit to what he's what he's talking about. There's the other option of bumping him off, or they can do what they did, which is is trying to discredit him. Yeah, well, what they did is what is uh, where they try to discredit him. Right. Uh, John, what, what do you think about the idea that? Uh, because obviously uh, they knew that he was a, he knew you, he knew yourself before he went for his interviews and stuff. That maybe he was uh, fed some disinformation while he was there. What are your thoughts on that? Whether he was disinformation? Well, no. Whether he was fed disinformation because he the, the um, when he they knew his relationship with you, so they maybe it's been speculated that basically they might have uh, fed him some disinformation while he was actually on the base. What, what uh, you, think on that? That you said uh, you're saying that uh, it's a possibility that they sent Bob Lazar as uh, disinformation. Well, no, knowing that, knowing that uh, obviously his relationship with you then is interesting in probably the subjects that you're interested in. That once he actually got there, saw the sources that he some of the because he read some of the documentation, for example, like Red might have been pre-written for. Uh, people to just distract or get distract from the idea that some of the sources are actually terrestrially made and are not necessarily all ET. I'm not following you, but <clears throat> the fact is, uh, my understanding is with the uh, MG 12 one, I'm trying to think of his name, he told Ron Gardner uh, the other day that uh, he specifically picked Bob Lazar uh, and specifically. Uh, picked him because he knew he would come to me uh, to release some of the information. 
And now that we go back and think about it, there's no possible way that if they wanted to keep it a secret, they would have let him come and talk to me. There's just no possible way. They had to know that uh, Lazar was going to come and talk to me immediately. John, tell us about some of the, the secret files that Bob has, uh, has seen um, and, and the, the, the way he got uh, higher clearance to see more and more. And, and what's the question? Uh, tell us about some of the secret files that he, he was um, privy to see from Roswell. Um, Bob wouldn't tell me what all the files. He said all he would tell me is uh, a lot of the nasty stuff we were involved in. And I said, uh, well, like uh, towing asteroids. And he said, oh, yeah, all that stuff. Uh, and we had just found out about <clears throat> that we were towing asteroids somewhere. I, I don't know whether that's true or not, because uh, in those days, uh, uh, you know, we had faked the Apollo missions, mainly because of the, um, uh, the radioactivity out in space. Uh, we would have had to find a way to uh, counteract that. Uh, but if we did, then uh, it's possible we were towing asteroids around. We may have been doing it uh, electromechanically, too, uh, sending out uh, uh, a, um, a vehicle and attaching itself and uh, making it go somewhere else. Um, we've touched on, uh, on anti-gravity earlier on in the show, and it's obviously something Bob Lazar has worked with, but you, your father actually... Uh, was one of the prime contractors for the Defense Department, and you say that, that they pretty much solved it by the mid-50s, the problem of anti-gravity. Yes. yes, we have the uh, official papers of him being uh, on the uh, list of prime contractors for uh, uh, anti-gravity in 1952, and we also, there's a um, videotape going around the uh, Internet. There's two or three of them, and they both have... Uh, pictures of my father moving pictures of him instructing at the Bonson Institute. Uh, in one of them, my mother is standing there while he's discussing uh, flying saucers, and he has drawn a uh, disc uh, vehicle on the uh, drawing board, and he's explaining something. It doesn't come with sound, but uh, it certainly does have a lot of pictures and also has a calendar uh, being flipped through as if something is very important, and they're designing something to reach a very important date. But I can't read the date, and uh, uh, and I'm but I'm sure that in 1956 uh, it was it was solved. Now that's just my opinion because in 1953 my dad I believe was kicked out of the program, and that's because he couldn't keep his mouth shut, and he was on down in Bogota <clears throat> on a um, just a, a company mission, nothing to do with flying saucers, and a, a, a reporter asked him about it, <clears throat> and he just shot his mouth off about uh, what he knew and where he thought they were going and where they were from and da-da-da-da-da. So I'm pretty sure at that point they knew that uh, Bill there couldn't be trusted and uh, kicked him out of the program. But what, what you mentioned there, John, is uh, the anti-gravity and the sources. Um, one of the things that uh, some people look at is the connection from the real sources that uh, Germany were developing under Hitler in the war. Do you, do you think maybe somewhere along the timeline that um, even possibly with Roswell and Aztec that a real saucer was captured by the US military and they took it to Green Lake for development? It's possible but I don't think so. I think they kept it down in Antarctica because I think it was completely separate from Groom Lake. And uh, Antarctica is where Hitler went and uh, more or less ran the program until 1968 when he passed away. Uh, and he may have passed away either down there or in the United States. Uh, probably the United States is where he passed away, but he was certainly running the, uh, uh, the Nazi program up until 1968. Yeah, that takes us quite nicely onto your theories about the moon. Um, it's, a, again, a subject that we've touched on on Planet X uh, in past shows over the last year or so, the fact that the Apollo missions never went to the moon. It's actually one of the, the touchiest subjects that we've approached on the show because when we talk about it, uh, we get uh, you know complaints from various people who, who don't or won't uh, you know have it that we, we faked the, the, the moon landings. Um, tell us some of your theories and thoughts on it. I started uh, investigating the moon about 25 years ago, and 
it's my firm conviction there is a civilization up there. Uh, I believe that they are identical to us, but far more sociologically advanced and technologically advanced. Uh, there's about, uh, I say a billion, but probably less, probably 500 million people up there. When I say that, I base that on all of the uh, cities uh, and um, uh, water resources, seas, um, um, uh, rivers, uh, towns, all kinds of stuff that, that I've brought, uh, been able to see up there. For the people who say, oh, well, that can't be true because there's no air up there. There's no air. There's they're up there because that's what NASA told you. There's plenty of air up there. As a matter of fact, uh, it's equal to 18,000 feet uh, uh, down here on Earth, and uh, there's plenty of air to breathe. Uh, and then they say, well, the gravity is uh, is uh, one sixth um, there. You couldn't uh, do this, couldn't do that. No, that's baloney too. Uh, the gravity is 70% uh, that of Earth. Uh, you can walk around fine. It can hold an atmosphere, which it does. The daytime uh, color of the sky is um, is saffron yellow, and that makes all of NASA's pictures of a daytime sky uh, uh, dishonest, ridiculous, and uh, and not true. And uh, it's it's a really a cool place up there. They have all kinds of stuff, and if, uh, you know, it's hard for people to to buy the fact that uh, there's people on the moon because they've been sold this. Uh, lie about uh, it being uh, uh, dark and uh, shadowy and there's no this, no that, and, and everything. And that's okay if people want to buy that. That's okay. <laughs> but you aren't going to sell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, John, um, what you touched on the atmosphere there, there is actually, NASA have actually uh, uh, published white papers that they think now that the moon is developing some sort of type of atmosphere uh, and we know that um, we, we never get a straight answer from them. But That's uh, apparently what it stands for, that, for doesn't it? NASA, NASA never, never a straight answer. Never a straight answer, yeah. <laughs> um, so what, the other thing as well, John, what people forget is that the moon is hollow. So what's your thoughts on the concept that there may be an internal space base on the moon? Uh, the moon is hollow like the earth is hollow. It's not hollow like a tennis ball. It's hollow just uh, several thousand or you know, several miles down. Uh, the earth has uh, at least four or five civilizations that live there, beginning with the uh, reptilians. Uh, but on the moon, there is certainly um, uh, a hollow <laughs> part uh, a couple of miles down, which is occupied by the greys. And the greys are the ones that do the... Um, uh, not the experimentation, but the uh, looking after of uh, of humans from Earth. And uh, what they do is they abduct them uh, and uh, take them to the moon, and they look to see that they're growing correctly, and they have the latest mods and uh, latest uh, updates, and then they bring them back. And that all occurs in a space of 40 minutes. So you can imagine how many they do uh, uh, of all time of the seven, of the uh, almost 8 billion people there are on Earth. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you could uh, <clears throat> if you could illuminate all of the saucers going back and forth at this instant from the, from, the saucer, from the Earth to the Moon, it would be almost totally black. There were so many saucers. But the fact is they uh, use the uh, cloaking uh, ability that they have to, uh, to cloak that out because they don't want people to know that much... Uh, transferring is going back and forth. John, do you think some of the astronauts who have been up in space and have actually seen some things have actually are aware of uh, the, the, well, what the craft are, or do you think they just keep quiet? I don't know what they, how they did the faking on... They faked some of the Mercury flights, they faked some of the Gemini flights, and they certainly faked most, if not all, of the Apollo flights. So what they were told, I know that uh, mind control works uh, very heavily into this because uh, the, the astronauts that I've heard uh, talk, they really honestly believe they've been to the moon. But the fact is they haven't been. So they've used this tremendous uh, ability to control the mind that was developed so highly in Germany and then brought over here uh, when the... Um, the first bunch of um, Nazis came over and uh, really, really 
uh, advanced it. <clears throat> so I don't know what uh, what the astronauts privately believe. I know that some of them saw a few strange things, but whether you know whether they saw or whether they know anything uh, like I'm talking about, it's it's doubtful. Now remember, on the 25th anniversary of the Apollo program. Um, uh, what's his name, Gordon? Uh, or, uh, Cooper. No, no. Um, the guy that's in the Senate. Oh, the guy that's in the uh, the Senate guy. Yeah, I, 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 it's not Gordon. It's not Gordon Cooper. Um, not Gordon. No. Um, anyway, the guy that we're yeah. thinking about <clears throat> that went up into space <clears throat> when he was uh, sixty or seventy years old, um, he said uh, there are. Greater things to imagine, greater things to see than you can possibly imagine. So, from what he said, it's possible that he does know something, but um, I don't know what what he meant when he said that in his little uh, 25th anniversary uh, speech. I want to get into uh, the secret space program in just a moment, but just sticking with the moon. I mean, when we've uh, done shows on whether the moon is fake and whether there are uh, structures on the moon we've had uh, um, amateur astronomers contacting us and saying well no we'd be able to see it um, I, I know the the late uh, Patrick Moore uh, one of the most famous uh, astronomers in, in our country uh, was adamant that a we went to the moon and B you know there was nothing you know uh, artificial artificially built on the moon um, are these people maybe just uh, part of the, the cover-up or uh, can they not really see anything up there don't they, don't they have well, the, the, the tools or the equipment it's hard to believe that they could look at some of the pictures i have for instance um lunar orbiter 2 162h uh that's the picture of the uh, inside face of uh, copernicus you know i can show them the uh, visible uh traces of um of vapor and uh and uh, cylinders, huge, and I can show them a, uh, a bucket wheel excavator. I can show them trucks. Can show them. Uh, can show them uh, um, buildings, and say, okay, well, if nobody's been there, then who built that, and when? And uh, even <clears throat> Hoagland is uh, trying to say, oh, that's uh, ancient stuff. Well, if it's ancient stuff, then they left the ignition on because. There's still vapor coming from the uh, uh, from the vehicles that are running. Do you think that's been, that stuff's been identified as transient lunar phenomena? Probably mis misidentified as that, but in astronomy, have you heard of transient lunar phenomena? I mean, could you say that again, please? There's a there's a the Patrick Moore, the famous uh, UK kind of astronomer. He was kind of adamant that such a thing as like I guess even gases uh, flowing across the vapors flowing across the surface of Mars and what didn't didn't exist. He was deadly opposed to it and would be as outspoken telling people like it couldn't possibly exist. Then one day he saw some. Well, it was all this all he described that as is just like vapor moving across the surface. But could that be with the stuff you're talking about, basically intelligently caused from machines? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it couldn't be possibly thing. be transient lights or anything like that. Uh, you're not going to get transients like that that look like a bucket wheel excavator that's 200 feet 200 feet high. Can't get a building uh, that looks 200 feet high that's uh, that um, looks like a um, uh, transit uh, <clears throat> uh, transit lights. There, there's uh, stuff up there. There's a uh, civilization up there. It's equal to five, about 500,000 or 500 million people. And, you know, if you don't want to believe me, that's fine. If you want to believe those guys who are saying it's uh, transient lights, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. The photographs that you refer to, these are not quite exactly freely available these days, are they? Because I'm led to believe that the photographs that were, I guess, released in, during some of the early emissions are some of the best ones for the sources of data. Is that correct? Because what you find on the internet, if you go to the NASA website, aren't it, images that will show you these kind of artifacts. The 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 photos that I'm looking at are the early lunar orbiter series that were launched between 1965 and 1967, looking for a spot for the um, uh, the hoaxed uh, Apollo missions to land. Those are the only ones that weren't really carefully airbrushed. Everything you see now, don't even bother to look at it because there is not going to be anything identifiable. Uh, all you can look at is all we have now is the uh, early lunar orbiter. 
uh, photos. John, for the benefit of our listeners, uh, where can they find those pictures? Uh, are they on any websites? Because I don't think you have an official website. And can we get them on Planet X? Um, you can uh, get them on, um, on uh, let's see, it's called um, um, thelivingmoon.com. Be sure and put the, T-H-E, livingmoon.com. Thelivingmoon.com, okay. I'm and then there's another one on. called... There's another one called uh, Pegasus Consortium Research or Pegasus Research Consortium. I forget which one it is, but that has a lot of pictures. Both of those have a lot of pictures, and they have a lot about the secret space program. Uh, there's so much going on in that secret space program. I believe there's about 2,500 to 3,000 astronauts currently uh, going up into space, and if you ask where, uh, there's uh, at least 21 different launch sites. Uh, the major one of them is uh, Kwajalein Island. Uh, there's a major uh, launch thing there, and they do uh, uh, at least two or three launches a week, and it's a very, very uh, busy program, and the reason it's, uh, the reason, the, the way they can keep it so secret is because Kwajalein is so far away. I'm glad you mentioned the secret space program, John. It's something that I looked into, the, the Solar Warden space program. And or, as you may be aware, uh, I don't know if you know, Gary McKinnon, uh, he's the guy, the British guy that hacked into U.S. military computers and is said to have... Yeah, my, my salute to him. He's great. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I've taken a lot of his information, you know, and uh, put it into mine. And I, I think the, the guy is... Uh, uh, he, he, uh, I don't know whether Snowden has done any better, but uh, um, uh, Gary has done a great job. Well, Gary, Gary uh, is the only person to, to target NASA, if you like, specifically. Um, and the, the Department of Defense in 2010 and last year confirmed to me in an email that the Solar Warden program was active. And uh, I can put, I can send you those emails and I've, I've put them up on the forum before. But it, again, we come back to the notion of bases on the moon. Um, what, what, what's your take on Jupiter? Get, get, what, what's, your, what's your thoughts on Jupiter? Are there bases on the moons of Jupiter or is there another connection there um don't say bases like on the moon the moon has a civilization it's just like earth there's roads and trains and and uh and rivers and streams and everything the same thing with mars the same thing with venus the same thing with neptune the same thing with jupiter they all have this stuff it's just that jupiter is extremely far more advanced the uh, our moon was made inside jupiter and uh, it has uh, some of the most fantastic construction uh, things available. And what I've been told by uh, Lou Baldwin, who has seen it himself, he said, John, let me tell you, if you got a peek at what Jupiter really looks like, he said you wouldn't be able to stand up for a day. It would be, would be so awe-inspiring. Yes, Jupiter is, uh, is a fantastic place. I just wish that I could see it. Maybe someday I will. I don't know. But uh, every single thing is being hid uh, by NASA about our solar and about our universe, which, uh, incidentally, our universe is infinite. It's not this baloney um, 17 billion uh, light years big. It's way larger than that. Yeah, one of the other things you say, John, is our solar system doesn't just uh, consist of nine planets. It's something more like 40? Right. There's 40 planets in our solar system. And uh, NASA is just starting, I think, to release uh, a few. But um, they're really having to come out with some information because uh, there's some people that really believe, like I do, that there is a civilization on the moon. And they're going to have to come up with some explanation you know, they've started admitting there's water there. Now they're going to have to admit uh, the rest of the stuff that I'm saying. Is this one of the reasons why we heard uh, a few years ago that China was uh, starting its own mission to, to the moon and then all of a sudden we don't hear anything? Is that, is that part of the reason? Yeah, probably we went over there and said, look, buddy, we'll tell you <laughs> uh, what's going on, but uh, don't say anything. We'll tell you everything we know. So and, John, of course, they didn't tell them everything we knew, but, <laughs> but they made them think we did. So, John, who controls the programs then? Because it, it doesn't seem like it's likely to be kind of your, your Congress and your Senate who's got control over that kind of stuff. 
So who's the Fagan. so who's who's the control of the, the the operations? Who it doesn't seem like it's the regular government that everybody kind of knows about. I don't know. It's a secret operation. It certainly isn't the president. He has no idea what's going on. It's way above uh, barrel. Probably... <laughs> Is it? I, I, uh, I, I, I wonder, John, if it's the same black ops people that have the uh, the secret entrance below the Bellagio Casino in Vegas that takes them out to Green Lake and Reno. Uh, the the um, railway that was built under um, the um, uh, the uh, See, what was the name of that casino at McCarran Airport? The, the the thing that's shaped like a pyramid. Oh, uh, uh, um, I can the, picture uh, it. The Luxor. 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 Yeah. Which yeah. That's here. where the um, <laughs> that's where the train uh, goes, and it goes uh, directly to. Um, uh, there's two tracks. One goes to um, Groom Lake and um, Paiute Mesa, uh, which is called Sandia. And uh, they call it Sandia because one of the things they're one of the things they're doing to mix up um, secret bases is to call them by previous names. Uh, the other place that a track go is uh, 40 miles south of uh, Wendover is the real secret base. And when I say real secret bases, uh, 20 years ago there was 32 air access only uh, secret bases, but uh, right now I don't know how many there is, but uh, the one where the uh, black triangles fly out of <clears throat> is 40 miles south of uh, uh, of uh, Wendover, and it's in a, um, um, a uh, valley called, um, I'm trying to think of the name now, Lieber Valley or something like that. <clears throat> but uh, that's where it is, and I get my information from people who have flown into there. Uh, it's hidden by holographics. Uh, if you fly over, it looks just like it was a desert, uh, and uh, if you're if you're going to land there, you're vectored in by radar to about uh, 200 feet, and then the um, uh, then the um, hologram is turned off. You see the airport land, and then it's turned back on again. That's one of the places. Uh, John, I've just got, because we're, we're, we're short on time, there's so much I, I want to squeeze in. Uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by some of the stuff that, uh, you know, I want to talk to you about. Um, one thing I want to, while we were still with the, the secret space program, um, your thoughts are that uh, it was the technology involved with the secret space program that uh, was the cause of 9-11. Oh, absolutely. Um, we launched... Uh, a, uh, we have in orbit 24, uh, 24 secret orbiting weapons, and one of those uh, uses the weapon of, uh, of um, molecular uh, dissociation, which dissolves the molecular, molecular makeup of uh, concrete and, um, and steel. And what they did is beam one of those down uh, for um, uh, buildings one, two, and seven and completely disintegrated them and that's why there's nothing left i mean there was if you um if you disintegrated a building like that you're going to have about 13 stories of regular stuff left like steel and uh, and concrete but in this case there's only one story of uh, or less of uh, steel and uh, concrete and that's because it was all disintegrated and so yes they did launch that from uh, space and part of the makeup of that uh, technology was um, the Hurricane Aaron which was stationed on uh, 100 miles east of New York and it was marched up from uh, Miami where it was originally um, uh, built about uh, 300 miles off the east coast of Miami, then it was marched up the east coast of, uh, of uh, the United States, and it was stationed in its position uh, 100 miles um, east of um, uh, New York to be part of the machine, the, uh, the electrical uh, machine that disintegrated uh, uh, buildings 1, 2, and 7. And the planes that we actually saw going into the buildings, that, that could have been uh, some sort of holographic image that we saw? It could have been holographic image or it could have been video fakery. Each one uh, fits, and I haven't uh, decided which one it could be. And, and I've just got to ask you, uh, because you know, you're know you a pilot, an ex-pilot of well, over 40-odd years, could you have done that with a plane, flown it into those towers? No, absolutely not, and there's other... Uh, there's other uh, pilots as qualified as I was 
uh, 20 years ago uh, that have tried that same thing, not launching from 7,000 feet, 20 miles out, trying to hit a building. It's just impossible uh, to do that, even as a, for an experienced pilot, uh, because you're going too fast. Now, if you get two or three tries at it, yes, it can be done because uh, <clears throat> uh, because uh, uh, you can have landmarks like uh, two miles away, four miles away, seven miles away, nine miles away, but you can't do it on the first try like these uh, Arabs supposedly had. No, there were no airplanes, no airplanes crashed, no airplanes uh, were there. Those were uh, holograms or video fakery. Well, they did have, what was it, two weeks basic training in a, in a biplane, so... <laughs> 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 Maybe they were qualified. <laughs> I, I think not. Um, guys, I know they've, you've got some more questions, uh, but I want to move it on very soon. But uh... Yeah, sure. Well, my, my, just my quick question to you, John, was re recently a, uh, a professor or physicist associated to NASA came out and said that he thought the sun was a stargate uh, what, what's your take on that no the sun is just uh, an electromagnetic sphere and it provides the um, electromagnetism that uh, provides the heat for our planets uh, our planets do, uh, get their heat uh, by our atmospheres filtering the electromagnetism. They don't get it from the actual heat from the sun. Uh, there's 40 different uh, um, uh, civilizations of aliens that live inside the uh, sun, and um, w the black holes that you hear people talk about are essentially washing machines for, um, for suns. When they're dying out, uh, they send them through the... Uh, uh, black holes and uh, that washes and cleans them and sends them out the other side uh, ready for another solar system. John, do you think there's any kind of agency on the planet kind of like that one would want to disclose this information? Pardon? Do you think there's any kind of agency or any government would want to disclose this information or do you think it's going to be permanently under wraps? All of the alien information? Well, everything you've been talking about today. Yes, uh, and uh, there will be what they call the disclosure will be in uh, about uh, four to five decades. Oh, um, really? <laughs> We're going to have to wait that long? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, four wow. to five decades from now because, uh, first of all, uh, there are guys like you and me would love to hear it, but yeah. there's also guys that wouldn't. And uh, so uh, we're going to have to wait a while for the... Uh, for the uh, that information to come out i want to talk to you briefly about mars um we're going to talk about it more on the show next week and, and we've had guests on who um have got their theories on on mars and, and there's uh and again we touched on it on a show a little while ago some amazing photographs and anomalies uh on mars um give us your take on it and and um obviously that you think that there are civilizations already living there mars has a civilization of uh uh eight billion uh, that's where the uh, uh, the Bigfoot comes from. Uh, what he what he does visiting here, I'm not sure. Uh, but yes, they've uh, they have plenty of water, plenty of atmosphere. Uh, we've been led astray by NASA in, in a lot of those pictures. Uh, uh, the pictures are not really Mars. There's some place some place in Death Valley. As a matter of fact, when I took a uh, remote viewing class here in Las Vegas, the morning that uh, the Mars Observer landed uh, on Mars, uh, the lady who taught the remote viewing class, her husband worked at uh, Groom Lake, and uh, when it landed on Mars, he said, that ain't Mars. He said, that's, uh, that's uh, Death Valley. That's where I work. And of course, he worked up at the test site, and he told her that, uh, that those pictures we were showing that's uh, allegedly Mars were uh, just a, uh, just um, the test site. The reason is it's so busy on Mars and so much going on up there that there's no possibility of uh, getting any uh, photographs that don't show anything. Yeah, uh, one, I, was gonna, I agree with you there, John, about Mars, uh, especially the test site as well, because the, 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 the terrain is very much like you see in the Mars pictures, and I can see now why they restrict public access to that area. I mean, yes, they were testing nuclear devices up on, uh, on, on, the, on the Area 51 site, but 
uh, surrounding those areas, especially around by Mercury, around there, uh, the, the township of Mercury, that that indicates to me, especially with the mountains, that the, it's associated and is the same as the terrain on Mars. Yes, and uh, so is Death Valley. So uh, there's a lot of pictures that come from Death Valley that uh, are supposedly uh, Mars. Um, we were talking uh, about the secret space program, John. Have they cracked the, the radiation problem? That, I don't know. And what about um, these civilizations, these aliens? We hear that there are X amount of different types of aliens out there. Uh, any ideas on who are the good guys, who are the bad guys? Is there an agenda? All I know is that in the uh, in the universe, there's there's a trillions times a trillion times a trillion times a trillion times a trillion uh, different types of civilizations, and there's even more than that. Um, the aliens that we made the agreement to get the uh, technology that we have are the bad aliens in this in this way. They're bad because they don't want us to advance. The other aliens that are sitting in the wayside and uh, waiting for things to take a, a, a change uh, are the good guys, uh, and they want to see us advance, but they're not quite as, uh, as strong as the, um, as the bad aliens, so we're going to have to just sit this one out. And I might as well say, it's nothing that you can do. The only thing you have to do is to live your life with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed, and to express your love to your family each and every day. That's all you have to do. You don't have to worry about the different types of aliens. You don't have to worry about <clears throat> Iraq or Iran or any of that stuff. Just relax, do your job, whatever you got to do, and live your life with integrity, without envy, hate, or greed, and express your love to your family. That That's really all you have to do. Do, do you think, John, that... Um saying just touching on what you're saying there people can connect with higher beings through uh meditation and spirituality uh, and the use of natural energies natural chakras do you do you believe that there is a way for ce5 contact through using using those techniques well they can without even using those techniques i mean there's there's our uh, <clears throat> uh our uh what do they call them? They're not godfathers, but the uh, the people that stand around and watch us each and every day, uh, they're out there. And uh, if they feel like contacting us, they can. If they don't, they, they won't. But our only job is what I told you, living with integrity and without envy, hate, or greed. And sometimes they will contact you if you ask. If you really want the, the heck scared out of you, you can go into a forest, go in, you have to go pick a dark forest where there's no lights, don't take any metal object, don't take flashlight of any kind or any weapon, and walk about uh, half a mile inside the dark forest, don't take anybody with you, or tell anybody where you're going, and walk inside this dark forest and stand there for about 15 minutes, and uh, <laughs> you will see something, and it'll be pretty scary. Most people don't want to do that, but uh, the fact is if you do just what I said, you will certainly meet up with an alien. Anybody up for doing that? Yeah. <laughs> Darren wants to do it. <laughs> well, that's your mission. That's your mission this week. Uh, I've just got a quick question, John, while you're on uh, from our forum. It says here, uh, John has... Here we go. John has talked about the towers on the moon and remote viewers uh, who have found themselves viewing the moon and being pulled in by some kind of uh, energy on the moon. Does John think that the Illuminati or the New World Order or the Shadow Government are in some way trapping souls and controlling the afterlife and reincarnation? Absolutely not. The Illuminati doesn't have anything to do with this. They're just, um, uh, they think they know more than they know. They don't have any control over this. Um, talking of the Illuminati, uh, uh, the overall uh, feeling that we are getting is that everybody seems to be awakening. A lot more people are waking up all over the world. We're seeing all these gatherings of people all over the world uh, standing up against uh, the, the, the so-called governments and, and also the shadow governments. Do you think that there will be a, a point in the not-too-distant future when we will get rid of this so-called Illuminati? Yeah, they'll more or less get rid of themselves uh, because... Uh, they don't do anything in particular. They don't have any uh, any uh, particular um, 
uh, hold and uh, just sit around, do what I said, and uh, just relax, and uh, things will come about. I'm only 70, or I'm 70, so I don't have long, long time to wait before I, I head off into the uh, fourth dimension. But um, the other people that are younger than I have, uh, than I am, uh, they can just uh, live with integrity without envy, hate, or greed, and uh, they'll be all set. Seems like a good way to live your life. Um, just briefly before we let you go, John, and it has been absolutely fascinating talking to you, and we've only really scratched the surface, uh, as we do with a lot of our guests. Um, I hear talks of, of your daughter, Jacqueline, uh, working on a book about you, and also the possibility of a film. Yes, sir. The full-length feature film being um, edited right now as we speak, and uh, it should be out in, um, well, less than a year. I don't know what, what the process is. And also, Jackie is uh, writing a book which will come out co uh, at the same time as the movie. Uh, any idea on, on what the movie is going to be called, and, and who out of Hollywood would you like to play John Lear? <laughs> <laughs> I don't George have Cleary? any idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, Soupy Sales? <laughs> <laughs> John, it's been absolutely great talking to you. Uh, is there anything that you want to uh, leave us with or leave our listeners with and, and uh, uh, how to yes. get in touch with you and, 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 and get more information on some of the amazing things that you've been talking about? Because you don't actually have an official uh, website, but there's uh, Godlike Productions. I think there's one there? out there. I think there's one out there called uh, I am uh, John Lear. The, wait, uh, John Lear. Oh, I forget what it is. Anyway, I want to tell the people <laughs> out there that... Uh, 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 to live your life with integrity, without envy, hate, or greed, and to express your love to your family each and every day. It's very important. Check out some of John's uh, stuff. Uh, there's loads of stuff online. There's loads of stuff on YouTube as well. Uh, John, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to talk to us. And we're hoping um, we can come over and visit you in uh, in, uh, in Vegas and uh, Nevada in the not-too-distant future. Yeah. It'd be great to come out there. I, I, anytime, I'll be here. Thanks, John. Cheers, John. Thank you. Oh, thank, thanks, guys. Planet X. The truth is on air. And that is just about it for this week. What a guy. He was uh, so interesting. And, and uh, as we do with most of our guests, we only just about scratch the surface. There's so many other things that we could have talked to him about. Uh, he's got great thoughts and views on Atlantis, for instance. Yeah, jo jo John, it's what an absolute pleasure to listen to a guy who's got a whole lifetime, 70 years of fascinating experiences. Um, brilliant. I'll be listening to that. And he's times. still good friends with a certain Bob Lazar, so, uh, you know, we could work on it. We could maybe try and get him on as a future there's a, guest. There's a door open there now for that. <laughs> you never know. He could be a future guest on Planet X. Uh, Anthony Beckett, thank you for uh, joining us. You're going to be back in next week because we're doing an Exopolitics special. Uh, and uh, it's the fifth year. It's going to be on the 28th of September. It's a Saturday, so hopefully you can all uh, get there. Uh, most people are free on a Saturday, and it's at Huddersfield University this, uh, this time around. Yes. Um, so who have we got on the show next week? So next week we have two uh, two of the actual lecturers from the for the conference coming up in September. We have the Andrew Johnson, who's a regular on this show, I think. And also Professor Chandra Wickramsing here. That's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the uh, director of the Cardiff Institute for Astrobiology. Good stuff. Uh, that's all on Planet X next week. Until then, have a good week. Be good to each other. And uh, we'll do it all again from 8 o'clock. But in the meantime, thank you to you for listening. And thank you to our Planet Experts, to Darren Pex and to Anthony Beckett. Thank you, guys. <laughs>
interesting. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X. Well, good evening, good afternoon. And good morning wherever you are listening to Planet X today. I'm Neil Atkinson and welcome to another show. Uh, we've got, as always, our Planet Experts in the studio and it's a warm welcome back for Darren Perks is back. Yay, good evening. For Darren. Yay. He's been be a back. very busy boy, but you're back with us. Yeah, it's great. It's good to be back in the studio and uh, cracking on with Planet X. It, it, when I'm not here, I'm in the background stalking. <laughs> Love it. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Anthony Beckett, Mr. Exopolitics himself, is uh, with us. Uh, welcome, Anthony. Well, thanks for having me, Neil. Yes. And uh, we're going to be talking briefly about uh, the next Exopolitics, which I think is the fifth. It is the fifth year. Yeah, so we've been going for five years. I can't really believe it, really. I, I can't believe it, A, that you've been going for five years and you haven't got any grey hairs. I'm getting there. For, for, <laughs> from doing exopolitics, because I know how stressful these things are. Uh, we'll talk more in just a little while, but we've got to mention our special guest tonight, uh, we, who uh, is going to be uh, joining us live on the next. We've times. had him on a few times. And he's is well known for his work in, uh, well, is a 9-11 truth activist and what... what uh, do, looking at the uh, evidence for direct, uh, use of directed energy weapons in 9-11. But for us, he's also been researching uh, basically anomalies in space and the solar system. And he's going to be t giving a talk about the secrets of the solar system. Okay. So, and uh, we've also got a, a former professor of uh, uh, astronomy from Cardiff University. Now, I'm glad you're going to say his name because uh, <laughs> I've got it written phonetically in front of me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, Professor Chandra, Chandra Wick, Wick, well, um, Professor Chandra Wick Ram Singh, a bit of a uh, difficult one to say. He was basically the, currently the director of uh, the Centre for Astrobiology in Cardiff. And uh, one of the things he's been do he was been doing from his, in his uh, since well, since about the 1960s, he was working with uh, the late uh, Fred Hoyle, right. who was actually a guy from my hometown in Bingley, in uh, near Keithley. And uh, they're basically in over, I guess it's now 40, 50 years. They've they put together evidence from astro from basic cosmology, showing that there is evidence for bacterial life in space, and that might be uh, what caught basically seeds life on the planets and other solar systems so they are going to be joining us on next week's show tell us uh, who else you've got lined up for uh, the the fifth year of exopolitics yes yeah, so we've got two what well, uh, three other people actually i'm speaking myself with andrew johnson i'm going to be discussing life on mars and the, the scientific evidence for that and uh, we've also got um, a regular um well, a reg I think a regular guest of yourself, haven't we? Well, yeah, apparently I'm going to be coming down and, and trying to host it. <laughs> yeah, Neil will, be ho Neil will be hosting the event. We've also got Mark Sullen going to be talking about the moon landings and the uh, lunar an anomalies. And uh, Dolan. Ah, yeah, we've got Richard Dolan coming Mr. over. Mr. Dolan. States. I knew there was somebody else. Yeah. And he's been, he did come over last year, but he's been a regular for the previous events. And he's uh, one of the basically leading his the UFO historians. And uh, he was recently at the, um, well, the, the, Congrats the hearings in DC, and he was one of the kind of oh, the panels of experts. Citizens, uh, the citizens yeah, 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 which we, we uh, touched on uh, a few weeks ago on, on uh, so, a former Planet X show. Yeah, so he'll be coming over to discuss his more his more uh, recent research into the um, his latest, well, the third the pending third, third volume of UFOs and the National Security State. Uh, now you mentioned Mars there and uh, some of the anomalies on Mars. I know that uh, John Lear, and you're going to stick around, aren't, aren't you, Anthony, for for our interview with John Lear? I know uh, John's got some fairly out there thoughts about mars and uh, the fact that it's uh, it's got a population already living there there are uh, ets living there yeah and, and we'll, we'll um, get into that with him a little later we're going to go into that with him because he'll tell you about all the structures yeah. on mars and the moon yeah they're, they're connected okay i won't say anymore okay uh, that's all with john lear a little later on but uh, as i say an exopolitics special uh, next week but we'll get into uh, more about that on the show a little later on from extraterrestrials to exposing the truth this is planet x okay uh because darren is back uh, darren is always uh, posting stuff on the forums and i want to cover some of the uh, topics that you've looked at this week where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the, the WikiLeaks stuff on, on ETs? Oh, go on then. Uh, WikiLeaks. We all know what WikiLeaks are, where uh, you either hate it or you love it. WikiLeaks. Um, some of the uh, documents that have come out over the last few years have been mainly about the Iraq war and Afghanistan war and cables between the UN and the US government, the UK governments. But this week, for the first time, and this is quite significant, 
however which way you want to look at it there has been a new wikileaks cable document that acknowledges extraterrestrial life now cast your minds back to about two or three years ago there was all the talk of wikileaks would they speak about ufos are they going to leak anything out but what's come out is that a leaked cable from january 2010 was sent from the afghanistan embassy to washington dc and um, what you have here is an ambassador in afghanistan who had a meeting with one of the local town mayors and his basic quote in the cable was along the lines of thank you to the usa for the continued help we know that there is life on other planets but we must have peace here first great statement to make because well personally i agree with that but you know, there's got to be peace here before we go and uh, interact with extraterrestrial races but this is the first time that this has popped up in wikileaks it's the first time that it's been spoken in in, in any way the mainstream media haven't picked up on this is only a few people that i know of that have come across it but go and have a look at it folks i've put it on the in the news section on the forum people can go and read it and there's a link there to the actual wikilinks uh, website uh, release if you like the page on that um, so yeah that, that's quite a good one because it's the first time that it's been acknowledged okay uh, another story that uh, you've posted on the forum and and this this has kind of been around for, for quite a few years is uh, the Japanese well uh, not so much the Japanese scientists uh, but the the um, using animals to uh, harvest human organs and uh, the phone from the states it's the one and only John Lear now John um, I could go on and on and on about him he is a retired airline captain uh, a former CIA pilot uh, he's also the son of the famous inventor of the Lear jet. Uh, he was best friends with the infamous Bob Lazar. And he's got some pretty, let's say, out there theories on all kinds of things to do with the moon, uh, to do with our solar system, uh, to do with ETs. Uh, tell us a bit more about uh, John himself, because uh, you've spent time with him out at uh, his ranch in America. Yeah, I did. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet John in May last year. Um, and the, the guy has a wealth of knowledge about UFOs that is it not only intriguing to listen to, but it, it's just so in depth. I mean, I, he first uh, pretty much got into UFOs back in the in the early 80s uh, and he developed this special relationship with Bob Lazar, obviously connected to Area 51. And um, John has over the years gathered so much information that he wants to share. Now, he does have some pretty extreme views on the moon and jupiter and other things in space and that's what we're going to hear tonight from him but um i think what pe what i want people to do is um try and relate to what john tells you tonight because there is going to be some absolutely amazing facts that come out from him so okay stay right there for john lear on the show very soon let's go back to anthony now we've mentioned there at the start of the show it's uh, the fifth year of exopolitics um, we're going to be doing an ExoPolitics special next week and uh, tell us who we've got lined up for next week's show uh, we've got andrew johnson who's like a regular speaker at the conference and yeah he's and a regular guest on, yeah, on 